y'all good morning grace point family my name is joe samsonic and this is my beautiful wife delicious and my son goo goo and my beautiful daughter tata and our beautiful little baby girl lolo and we just want to welcome you to the grace point church this morning the broadcast that we have for you today and we're just excited and just are happy to continue the sermon series that Pastor Josh has been working on called Bible Stories for Grownups. And today's topic is actually going to be on Samson. You know, a guy kind of like me, you know. But we just wanted to make sure you guys sit back and enjoy what is about to come to you. All right? Great. Cut! Welcome to Grace Point. We are a progressive Christian church. Loving our community by gathering in our homes. Even as we practice social distancing. We're asking big questions about what it means to be human. What it means to love our neighbors. And what it means to follow Christ. We're cultivating a safe virtual space 
to deconstruct or reconstruct. To question and to grow. We are welcoming, affirming, and fully inclusive. Because who you are and who you love are celebrated here. While we may be physically apart from one another, we believe we're never truly alone. You are never alone. We're together in this. We're, we're together. together in this. So even though we can't give you a hug just yet, we want you to know that you are beloved, you are included, and you are affirmed. Welcome, Welcome to Grace Point. Welcome to Grace Point. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. I lift my eyes up to the hills This my morning song Where my strength comes from I lift my eyes up to the hills This my evening song Where my help comes from This is the gravity just as the moon follows the sun, you're all around me. You're holding everything. This is the hope of every land. Just as the universe expands, your love is reaching. You're holding everything. We lift our eyes up to the hills. When will our help come? Lord, we cry, how long? We lift our eyes up to the hills. Even as we run, hope is chasing us. This is the gravity. As the moon follows the sun, you're all around me. You're holding everything. Just is the hope of every land. Just as the universe expands, your love is reaching. You're holding everything. This is the gravity of love. Just as the moon follows the sun, you're all around me. You're holding everything. This is the hope of every land. Just as the universe expands, your love is reaching. You're holding everything. Good morning, Grace Point kids and Grace Point youth. Let's talk about the many ways that we can connect this week. Grace Point youth, we connect throughout the week on our GPY Discord. On Thursdays at 6.30, we hang out on the GPY Discord. Every Sunday afternoon, I share a reflection guide there. Speaking of Sundays, if you wanna hop over to our GPY Discord, we are there chit-chatting about gathering happenings and Pastor Josh's latest message. For an invite to our GPY Discord, email me at lisa at gracepoint.net. Grace Point kids, I know it is so much fun to connect with our friends. If you are missing your GPK pals and would like to connect with them, join us for a GPK Zoom hangout every Saturday at 10 a.m. We read a story, we talk about everything that we have learned and explored from this last week, and we usually end our time with a show and tell and a few jokes. It's pretty fun and funny. Speaking of fun, last week we were welcomed to our GP Kids Bitmoji Gathering Space. This virtual gathering space is an interactive platform for our weekly activities and discussion guides. Each room of the virtual space features audio recordings to make navigating the space more inclusive. GP Kids, you will have so much fun exploring the space by clicking on the toys and storybooks. And we can have fun exploring this week's topic by clicking on the pink bins and the pink buttons in our Bitmoji gathering space. 
This week we conclude our discussion about the parables of Jesus. We focus on the parable of the sower and we ask ourselves how that parable can inspire us and challenge us to love those around us really well. And for those of you who enjoy the one-page interactive lesson guides, those are still being created for and shared with you. If you're curious about what is being created for and shared with our GPK and GPY families, check out our Instagrams at Grace Point Kids TN and at Grace Point Youth TN, our Facebook groups, and your email inbox. If you'd like to be added to our email list or need anything at all, reach out to me at lisa at gracepoint.net. All right, peace out, big air hugs, and so much love to each and every one of you. For our announcements this week, join us each Sunday morning at 1030 on YouTube to hang out as a community and to chat before and after the service. Meet us each Wednesday evening at 630 for Reconstruct on Facebook. Books and Bruce has a new book to dive into. We will be discussing Karen Gonzalez, The God Who Sees, on Tuesday, September 15th at 6.30 p.m. And I believe we all know that it takes more than just coming to service here at Grace Point. We also need to be of service. And there are two ways to, that we can give to this family. First, by texting Grace Point to 77977 or by going to our website, gracepoint.net. We hope you will enjoy Josh's message on Samson today. Have a good morning.
so glad you're here with us today. Um, this morning, unfortunately, we find ourselves in some all too familiar territory. Over these months of quarantine, um, we've become familiar with some names, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and this week we became familiar with the name of Jacob Blake. Jacob is, um, as of the recording of this message, still in hospital, paralyzed, still fighting for his life after being shot in the back seven times by a police officer in Kenosha, Wisconsin. On top of that, um, protesters who were out protesting against police, police brutality were killed um, by a 17-year-old who had a gun he shouldn't have had, who was in a place he shouldn't have been, who, did so, who engaged in a way that he shouldn't have been engaged. And so we continually have to come back to this moment, it feels like. And I just want to say to um, the members of our community, to our friends, to anybody watching this who's a member of uh, the BIPOC community, specifically those of you who, over these months, this has been like one, just one thing after another, and I cannot imagine how tired you are right now. I cannot imagine how utterly exhausting it has to be, waiting on everybody else to wake up. Uh, listening to uh, Jacob Blake's father on the radio the other morning, um, he talked about his son, and he said he's a human being. He's not an animal. He's a human being, and he's not been treated like a human being. We have elected leaders who refuse to utter the phrase, Black Lives Matter. We have elected leaders who refuse to even acknowledge what's happening in our country. We have elected leaders who refuse to acknowledge the role that their rhetoric and their positions that, that refuse to really embrace how they have stoked this and brought this to such a fever pitch. And so today, we just, as a community, we make space. Where, wherever you are, um, whatever your zip code, however you're hurting, um, there's a space for you in this community. And we love you, and we affirm that Black Lives Matter. And we, have, we will affirm that with our words. We will affirm that with our feet. We will affirm that in whatever way we need to as a community to make sure that that message gets out loud and clear. And I'll say this, we have, and we'll, this will sort of come back around this morning, but we have an addiction to violence in this country. We have an addiction to violence in this country. It's, it's unbelievable to me that some people think that wearing a mask out makes you seem like you're living in fear. Because when I see people out like wearing guns everywhere, I don't look at them and think, wow, they're not afraid. <laughs> I don't look at them and think, that's an adjusted, well-adjusted human being just going about their day. I see a person who's really, really afraid. I don't wear a mask because I'm afraid. I wear a mask to keep myself healthy and to keep you healthy. Why in the world do we feel the need to pack guns everywhere? I think that maybe is a more important question. Um, and so I want to lean in today to a Bible story. And this story actually, will, hopefully, will, will be able to speak to some of what we're processing today as well. And so if you're just joining us over these past several weeks, we've been revisiting some familiar Bible stories, trying to see them from a new vantage point. And today we're going to look at a story of a man named Samson, and we're going to maybe do some creative reimagining with his story. I have to admit, as a kid, this one was one of my favorites. 
Uh, Samson is a kind of Herculean, Hercules-like figure, super strength. He could do some really amazing feats of strength, and he didn't take junk from anybody. I also grew up reading the King James Version of the Bible in the little Free Will Baptist Church I, I was a part of as a kid. And one of my favorite parts, and one of the reasons I love the story is because when you came around the Judges chapter 15, you could read this line. And he, Samson, found a new jawbone of an ass and put forth his hand and took it and slew a thousand men there within. Man, I, first of all, I would always giggle because I got to read the word ass in the Bible in church. <laughs> But there was also sort of the, the adventure side of it, right? Samson was unarmed, and he comes in, and he grabs a jawbone, and he kills a thousand men with just the jawbone of a donkey. You see, I think that that's why we need to come back to these stories as grown-ups. As a kid, I was not aware of the gravity of the situation. I, I, I don't think we want to gloss over the slaughtering of a thousand human beings. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. First, I want to give you a bit about the, where we find the Samson story. We meet Samson in a book called Judges. To situate this chronologically in the narrative of the Bible, now I'm not saying this is when it was written. I'm saying that if the Bible has a story arc and a narrative, this is where the book of Judges would fit in the narrative. Uh, it would begin with Exodus from Egypt. So the people, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt and, and God rescues them and liberates them. And then they go into the wilderness for 40 years of wandering in the wilderness in a very small piece of land. They wander for 40 years. Eventually, that leads to the conquest when they cross the Jordan River into the, the promised land of Canaan. They in, engage in a conca- conquest, and that's we could spend a whole lot of time talking about that. It's, it's a really dark part of the Bible, and I, 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 we'll come back to it at some point. And then after the period of conquest, there's the period of judges. Now, when, when we talk about judges, I think we have a very specific sort of, uh, I don't know who pops in your mind, Judge Judy or, or whoever might pop into your mind. Um, but when we think about it, we're not talking about people who walked around in long black robes uh, per- pronouncing people guilty or not guilty. Judges in the context of the Hebrew scriptures were temporary leaders who were called to help Israel overcome their enemies who were oppressing them. Um, there's actually a pattern present in the book of Judges. So it begins with Israel does something and the text says the Lord saw as evil. So they do something to sort of stray away from their relationship with Yahweh, with God. And as a result, they end up being oppressed by their enemies. Now, when the people cry out to God in this oppression, God hears them. And then God raises up a judge who comes in to lead, to liberate, and and to rescue the people. So this is not a long-term position of power. It's not like you're the judge, you you rescue them, and now you're like president or king or anything like that. You do your, your bit, you're empowered for a bit, you rescue the people, and then you go about your life. You're no longer in charge. So Samson was one of these judges. Uh, And he lived in one of those times of oppression. And so his story begins in Judges 13, and it actually begins with these words. The Israelites again did things the Lord saw as evil. He handed them over to the Philistines for 40 years. Right, so the Israelites have done some things that God, Yahweh in this case, God says, this is not how I I want you to live in relationship with other people uh, as a community. And then they are now being handed over to the Philistines for 40 years And then the story of Samson begins. Now, the context of Samson's narrative is essentially the context of oppression. It's his people are, when he enters the scene, 40 years they've been oppressed by the Philistines. And he is going to be uniquely positioned to do something about it. So what I want to do is I want to give you a bit of an overview of his story. And then at the end, just offer a couple observations or a couple takeaways that I've sort of landed on. Again, this was one of my favorite stories as a kid. If you want to know the level of Bible nerdery I had as a child, even, um, I had I had a Samson action figure. He had like wild long hair, which you'll find out about in a minute. And he had a jawbone, which you've already heard about. Um, I also had like a Jonah and the, the big whale fish looking thing. Um, it, it, I mean, that's... I had some adventurous imaginative play as a child with like Batman, Superman, and John the Baptist, and it was, it's weird. Um, so <laughs> the story of Samson begins, like a lot of stories begin in the Bible and in the ancient world, it begins with a miraculous birth. And actually these stories of unlikely or miraculous births uh, weren't uncommon in the ancient world, and they're not even uncommon in the Bible. It would actually be more noteworthy for a person who had achieved a certain level of status and notoriety and respect, it would be actually more noteworthy if they didn't have a miraculous beginning. 
Um, because in some ways, so in the Bible, this happens with the story of Isaac, which we've looked at, uh, at least who he is and part of his story. Joseph, another patriarch, Samuel, John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, even Jesus. And then there are others who enter the world through uncommon means. A lot of times it's that the parents are older and they've been able to unable to conceive and suddenly they're having a baby, right? And Jesus's story was a little bit different than that. But these stories, they, sort of, they act as kind of a teaser trailer, giving us a glimpse of who these kids will grow up to be. So they sort of are, are like um, just sounding some beginning notes of, this, of, the, of the piece of music and you're gonna hear them repeated later on, right? So Samson's story is similar. His parents were able to conceive until one day an angel of the Lord appears to his mother and tells her that she is now pregnant with a son. The angel tells her, Judges 13, now be careful not to drink. So he's saying this to the pregnant mother. Be careful not to drink wine or brandy, good advice, or to eat anything that is ritually unclean because you are pregnant and will give birth to a son. Don't allow a razor to shave his head because the boy is going to be a Nazarite for God from birth. He, he will be the one who begins Israel's rescue from the power of the Philistines. So essentially the angel comes and says, you've been, you've been able, able to have a child. You're going to have a child. It's going to be a boy. He's going to be a liberator. And he's also going to be this thing called a Nazarite. Now, Nazarite is a, uh, essentially a word, that, a word that means devoted one. So to be a Nazarite like Samson is supposed to be, it means that you've made a certain vow, and it's found in the book of Numbers chapter 6, and it's committing to a certain service and relationship with God. So there are three requirements of being, to be a Nazarite, to, to make the vow and actually to fulfill it. One is you couldn't drink any wine, alcohol, or anything made from grapes. Uh, you couldn't get hair. You couldn't cut your hair. You had to let your hair grow during the period of the vow. Not your whole life necessarily, but for whatever time you've made the vow. So no, no wine, nothing from grapes, no alcohol, no haircuts, and you couldn't come in contact with death. Specifically, it says you, if like you can't come in contact with the corpse, um, because this would make you unclean. And this is true outside of the Nazarite vow. Um, but so people would generally have to do that, right? Someone passes away, you have to care for the the body. Samson, because of his vow, can't do that and even like do it, become ritually clean later and then back. You, you just have to avoid it altogether. So here's the, here's the headline you kind of, Samson's going to be a Nazarite and part of what he's going to have as a resort, result of this, and the text doesn't spell it out, but you just sort of notice it. Uh, it's very obvious, is he, he, get, he has this extraordinary strength that if he keeps this vow, he has sort of this superhuman strength, this Herculean kind of strength. So the next major episode in Samson's life is his marriage. Uh, Samson uh, marries a Philistine woman. And you may be wondering, where I heard that? The Philistines are the people oppressing them, the people Samson's supposed to be liberating his people, the Israelites, from. And I'm only going to hit on the essentials for this. I mean, we could spend a whole day on this story. Um, but I, wanted to make, I want the story to make sense. But there's a lot here if you're interested in going back after we finish today. So the elevator pitch, the elevator summary would be that Samson marries a Philistine woman. Uh, and at the wedding feast, Samson tells a riddle to 30 of the Philistine men. And the stakes are this. If they, by the end of the wedding feast, if they can answer the riddle, he will give each of them a pair, a set of clothes. So 30 of them. He's got to give 30. Uh, but if they can't, uh, by the end of the wedding feast, then they have to each give him a set of clothes. So he would walk out with 30. Now, he asks them a riddle and... Um, I won't get into it, but he asks them a riddle that only he and only he could know the answer to. So it's almost a little unfair. He doesn't give them a shot. There's no way they could understand. This is something that happened to him and only he knew about and he didn't tell. The text even says just he didn't tell anyone. So he, he gives them this riddle they don't know and the, the feast begins to draw to a close and the Philistines are angry and they pressure his wife to give them the answer. And so she manages to go and draw it out of Samson. She tells it to the Philistines and then they tell it to Samson. And Samson responds to them with a super misogynistic, terrible sort of response. And then Samson goes on a tear. After all, he's got to provide 30 sets of clothes. Judges 14. And this first line is really, really interesting. We'll, we'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. Then the Lord's spirit rushed over him. And he went down to Ashkelon, the capital. He killed 30 of their men, Philistines, stripped them of their gear and gave the sets of clothes to the one who had told the answer to the riddle. In anger, he went back up to his father's household and Samson's wife married one of those who had been his companions. 
the spirit of the Lord comes on Samson and he goes and he kills 30 Philistines. I, I, I mean, there's just so much here. He kills them. He takes their clothes and he gives it to the other Philistines who he owes the clothes. I guess there was no stipulation that these, these clothes had to be new. I mean, these are, would you, this is like gently used. I don't, like I don't know, but, but you get sort of Samson's rage here. Um, and, and then I would say, what about the Nazarite vow? I mean, he can't be near death, right? Don't come, come in contact with the corpse. And he's out making corpses, right? Killing 30 of their men. And, and then, I, I'll say this. It says the Spirit of the Lord rushed on. I know lots of people who believe they were led by the Spirit to do a lot of terrible things to other people. And it is an explanation, I think, in this text, which we resist and critique rightly. I mean, often, I mean, we would do this anyway. If somebody came up to you and said, yeah, I think the Lord's telling me to go, you know, kill 30 Philistines. I think somebody would say, hey, don't, that's wrong. God's not telling you to kill 30 Philistines, right? But when it comes to the Bible, we sort of give that stuff a free pass, Oh, sure. Well, if it says in the Bible that God told him to kill all his people, it must have been God. Without understanding, no, no, no. Maybe, maybe the Bible isn't off limits. Maybe we actually are allowed to push back on our ancestors' assertions of what God did and did. <laughs> maybe we can say, hey, I don't think God has ever, in the history of history, I don't think God has ever told anyone to kill anyone else. I just don't believe that's true. Right? So I, I think we have to begin to be able to push back on that. So what Samson does here is not only a violation of his Nazarite vow, like avoid corpses, but it's a total misunderstanding of who God is and what God is like. And to make it even worse somehow, Samson doesn't do this to liberate his people. He's a judge supposed to liberate his people from the Philistines. He doesn't do it to liberate his people. He does it because he lost a bet, right? He does it because he is in the middle of a squabble with his in-laws, and the story keeps going. Samson um, continues his, uh, I guess we'd say, rampage. So the next episode sees Samson going back to visit his wife. And if you remember during the, the end of the last text, she actually, he leaves and her father essentially gives him to one of the people who'd been at the wedding because he thought Samson, you know, was not going to, I guess, stay with her because he left. And so he goes back at the time of the wheat harvest, to discover that she's been given to another Philistine man by her father. Oh, the patriarchy, right? I mean, yes, completely 1 million percent. That's a problem. Uh, listen to the text in Judges 15. So Samson finds out that she's been given to another man, and he says this, No one can blame me now for being ready to bring down trouble on the Philistines. Then Samson went and caught, Samson went and caught 300 foxes, like you do. He took torches turned the foxes tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of tails. He lit the torches and released the foxes into the Philistine standing grain, grain fields. So he burned the stacked grain, the standing grain, the vineyards, and the olive orchards. Number one, 300 foxes, tail to tail, torches, tying them together. I mean, like, I, I do think this has a bit of a, this is, this is a bit of a, are we taking this literally at this point, right? But beyond that, I mean, does he have it? Like, I'm just trying to imagine this scene. Does he have an assistant? Like, have you ever caught foxes and tried to tie them tail to tail? Have you tried that? I mean, I, you can't even do that with a cat. I and mean, those are domesticated. So I just imagine that this, like, this is a whole big mess. But if you really get what's going on, what Samson does here, he essentially says, well, now they've done this to me, so I've got a right to really get even. And what he does I mean, it seems like, well, he just, he, he burned down some fields. No, no, no. It's the time of the wheat harvest, and he destroys the stacked grain, the standing grain, the vineyards, and the olive orchards. Samson decimates their economy, right? He goes nuclear and decimates their economy. The harvest is gone. How will they eat? How will they barter? How will they trade? How... He's completely decimated. Again, why? Why does Samson do this? To liberate his people? I mean, it would be problematic even then, right? Like, I don't think we want to agree, like, oh, you want to liberate your people so you just destroy it? No, no. But we could at least say he achieved something. This is just about his own petty squabbles. This is just about Samson's own ego. And it doesn't stop there. 
Judges 15 a little later, the Philistines inquire, who did this? As if you need to, like, as if you're wondering, who, 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 who would have caught 300 foxes and tied them tail and lit them on fire? So it was reported, Samson, the Timnite's son-in-law, did this because his father-in-law gave his wife in marriage to one of his companions. So the Philistines went up and burned her and her father to death. We have, we have a sort of a, 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 a lost bet that leads to 30 deaths, that leads to another insult, that leads to 300 foxes decimating the economy, that leads to this woman and her, her father being killed. Samson then responded to them, if this is how you act, I won't stop until I get revenge on you. He struck them hard, taking their legs right out from under them. All right, so it's like, oh, you're going to do, the, oh, okay, well, this is how you're going to act. I mean, like, as if Samson has acted nobly, as if Samson has acted rationally, as if Samson has acted in any way that is fitting with his role as a judge in Israel, who's supposed to be about liberating the people. This has all been about his own ego. So eventually, to sum some things up, he allows himself to be captured. It's a complete ruse. Uh, later in Judges 15, when Samson arrived at Lahai, the Philistines met him and came out shouting. So he's bound up and they think they've got him. The Lord's spirit rushed over him. Problematic again. The ropes on his arm became like burned up linen and the ties melted right off his hands. He found a donkey's, fr- we're back to the donkey jawbone. He found a donkey's fresh jawbone. Pit because if you're, I mean, some of these details, like if you're going to use a donkey's jawbone, at least get a fresh one. He picks it up and uses it to attack 1,000 men. When it's all the dust settles, Samson said, with a donkey's jawbone, stacks on stacks. He starts making a, a, a bit of poetry. With a donkey's jawbone, I've killed 1,000 men. When he finished speaking, he tossed away the jawbone. I mean, this is wanton destruction. This is a thousand human lives. And at the end of it, Samson just chucks it, gets rid of it like, okay, it's, it's sort of like, like Bruce Willis or Tom Cruise, like just tossing away a gun with an empty clip when they're done just wiping some people out in one of their movies. I mean, this is, as a kid, this was exciting to me. This story was exciting. Samson is a hero. Samson's fighting on behalf of Israel and he's taking it to Israel's enemies. Nope, that's not what's happening. Samson is on his own vendetta. He doesn't care about his people. He doesn't care about their oppression. He doesn't, he's using all this power that he's been given, all this strength for his own petty reasons. You see how out of control this thing has gotten? And it's still not over. There are other episodes, but probably the most famous story that Samson's known for is the story of Samson and Delilah, another Philistine woman who he falls in love with. And in this case, the Philistine leaders convince her to discover his, the secret of his strength. How is he so strong? What makes him so strong? Because they want to exploit his weakness. And so eventually, I mean, there's this back and forth where she, he tells her something, but it's not right. And she tells them. And so they come in to get him as he's asleep at her house. And I mean, this happens multiple times. And eventually, he still tells her the secret that if his hair is cut, that he will become like any other person. It's just, his kryptonite would be his hair being cut. So he fell asleep, his head was shaved, and when he woke up, he was a prisoner of the Philistines, and he tried to snap his bonds like he had previously done to no avail. They gouged out his eyes, they placed him in chains, and his humiliation was complete. Yet, there's this line in the text that says, so so it's, it's interesting because you would think the whole vow, like he's been around corpses, I imagine at the wedding feast when he's telling riddles, there's probably been a little bit of wine flowing. So it's this one thing, like the hair is the thing that does it. Um, and the text tells us this interesting detail that he's like pushing a millstone. Like that's his new job. His eyes are gouged out. He's in chains. He's pushing a millstone. And it says that his hair began to grow again. And you might expect this story ends tragically. At a festival for their God, the Philistines bring Samson into their temple. And they're going to mock him and have him sort of perform some things so they can make fun of this great, once mighty man. And here's how the story ends. He's in the temple. Samson grabbed the two central pillars that held up the temple. He leaned against one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. He strained with all his might and the temple collapsed on the rulers and all the people who were in it. So it turned out that he killed more people in his death 
than he did during his life. Let's really hear that last sentence and let's let it settle in. It turned out that he killed more people in his death than he did during his life. Is Samson a hero? Is, is he somebody to be emulated or admired? Is, is it something we would want? Like I'm thinking, do I want my kids to fall in Samson's footsteps? Absolutely. Of course, absolutely not. So what do we do with this story? It's a story that as an adult, as I come back as a grown-up, it doesn't mean the same thing to me. It's actually really, really troubling. And I, I think it's, it's not like a, a tale of heroicism. It's a cautionary tale. And so I I begin with this. I think Samson's story is about what we do with our power. It's a little counterintuitive to say that because to say that Samson has power because Israel is being oppressed by the Philistines. Samson is technically a member of an oppressed, marginalized group. Yet Samson clearly has power and he uses it again and again and again, but not to deliver his people, not to ease and alleviate their suffering. He, He doesn't use it in any way for anyone other than himself. He uses the power for only himself, and he breaks the vow, the Nazarite vow he made, at every turn on every page. See, there's this tendency in in people, in us, is to try to bring power up and in. And what I mean is to bring it up to the top, to to the top of the hierarchy, to the top of the pyramid, to the people who have the power and the wealth. We want to bring power up and in, meaning holding it tightly and protectively. Right? That's why you make it a felony to protest. That, that, that's why you employ tear gas for a photo op at a church. It's why we hold on to power and try to keep it at the top. It's why we can't get a certain elected leaders to affirm that black lives matter. Or to acknowledge that if we don't make reforms when it comes to policing and guns and a whole lot of other things, we are in some really, really big trouble. There are people all throughout Scripture who take this approach, keeping power up and in. And in telling those stories, the Bible is trying, I think, to be descriptive, not prescriptive. Because it never turns out well. I mean, Solomon, one of the most wise and powerful rulers in the Hebrew Scriptures, and it's actually his terrible policies that lead to the United Kingdom falling apart and going into civil war at his death. Right? The, the Bible's full of people who advocate this posture of pulling power up and in. But the scriptures also are full of another, and, and I actually think the scriptures seem to advocate this, is the posture of pushing power down and out. This is seen in Jesus' interaction with his own disciples, who again and again and again are operating from an up and in sort of power perspective. They want to keep the turkle, cir- turkle? circle tight. They want to keep the access low. And Jesus calls for a wider and wider circle, one that shares power and empowers other people to do the work in the world. This is why when the disciples come to Jesus and say, hey, hey, there's a guy over there casting out demons in your name. We should stop him. We tried to stop him, but he won't listen to us. And Jesus is like, good. Less demons is better. Let him go. He's not against you. He's with you. Right? It's when the children want to come see Jesus and the disciples try to push them away. And Jesus says, no, this is is the kingdom of heaven. This is what God's kingdom ultimately is like. And Samson is an example of somebody who used power again and again, up and in, holding it tightly for his own purposes, to advance his own selfish agenda, an an agenda that ultimately led to his tragic death and the tragic death of thousands of other people around him. How will we use our power? Maybe that's one of the questions this story is trying to ask us. Whatever power you have, whatever amount of power, authority, whatever you've been given, how will we use that? I mean, simply as an American citizen, how will I use that power? Well, I use it to insist that, that we, we somehow are exceptional above anyone and everyone else and that we matter more than everybody else. Or will we use it to try to bring healing and justice and hope to the world? We have these questions. And we have these responsibilities that are being placed that we're actually most of the time really, really happy to hold on to. So what are we going to do with our power? And second, I think the story of Samson is a story about the way revenge works, and maybe a better way to say it, the way revenge doesn't work. So last week we saw Esau, who had been cheated by his brother out of his blessing and birthright. And Esau did not seek revenge. And in Esau's refusal to seek revenge, we see the face of God. Essentially, if you want to know what God looks like, it's this, loving enemies. 
extending kindness and compassion to even those who have harmed him. In Samson, we see the opposite. We see this endless cycle of revenge played out in painful detail. I remember when I was a kid, we had an Atari. That was before Nintendos were a thing. And I loved playing Miss Pac-Man, Pac-Man and Mrs. Pac-Man. Uh, and I loved Space Invaders. Um, but we also, I also loved Pong. I was just bad at it. I'm, I'm still bad at Pong. It, it was just never as easy as it sounded. You have these two bars and then there's this little ball and you're just like moving them and knocking it back and forth. And it sounds simple. And there's sort of this little like, like 64 bit sound effect that goes with it. And it's just sort of this, right? It's back and forth. The goal is to keep it going back and forth. And hopefully eventually the person you're playing will miss and you'll get a point. The, the goal is to keep it going. Just volley it back and forth. And, and that's actually what really happens with revenge. When you think, like, eventually I'm going to, like, you know, Andre Agassi, like, it's like Steffi Graf. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to William Sisters this thing into the corner and I'm going to win. But that's not how it ever works. Like, nobody ever gets punched in the face and says, okay, we're even. Right? That's, revenge is just this, it's, it's a cycle. And it just, it sucks us in and it keeps us in this sort of back, the cyclical you do this to me, so I do. I mean, this is the Samson story, right? Like, oh, you did this to me? Well, I'm going to do that. And now, well, since you've acted like this, nobody would blame me. And like this back and forth, back and forth. And where does it end? How do we get off this ride? How, how do we stop this spinning thing that have essentially humans have been riding for as long as humans have humaned, right? Like this has been a problem since very early on in the human story. Where, where does it end? It, 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 and look, if we... Let's take thriving off the table. If we want to survive, we have got to find a better way to process our anger, hurt, grief, and pain. And it is very much an unlearning. I watch my kids and how quickly we can be sitting in the living room and everybody's playing with toys and how quickly, I mean, like the blink of an eye, it can devolve into baby fight club when there's a contested toy that another kid wants, right? Like, and, and, and sometimes you just see the anger and you see the willingness to, to bite, to pinch, to smack, like whatever it takes. To, I want that toy. And, and it's almost like violence has been embedded in us by years of evolutionary process. Sort of this um, winner take all, our survival is all that's, right, right? This sort of this thing that enabled our species to survive in a way is now the thing that threatens our survival if we don't learn to let it go. Violence has definitely been embedded in us in the evolutionary process, but so is the capacity to choose something else, to choose what Jesus called enemy love. We are not bound to the responses of our parents and grandparents or anyone else. We get to choose. We get to choose our responses to the world. We get to choose not to keep the pain in circulation. We get to choose to resist without returning evil for evil. That's our choice. And may we choose a better way to approach our power, and may we find a better way to process our pain, because this world and every marginalized, hurting, excluded, forgotten human being is counting on us as, as, as a species. We've got to be able to do this differently. We've got to be able to do this better. We've got to be anti-Samson's. We've got to live in a way that when we leave, I don't want the end of my story to be, he hurt as many people in death as he did in life. I, I, I would hope that the story would be very different for me and for you. What are we going to do with our power? And, and what are we going to do with our pain? That's, that's the question I think the Samson story invites us to grapple with. Standing on this mountain top, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us. Kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory was your power in us. 
scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say. Never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did you leave us on our own. You are faithful, God, you are faithful. Kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory is your Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say. can say, never once did we ever walk alone, carried by your constant grace, held within your perfect peace, never once, no, we never walk alone, never once did we ever walk alone. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We're so glad that you were a part of this gathering. Um, next week, we're going to continue our Bible stories with another story that's kind of a beloved story, I think, for a lot of people. It's a story, um, the book of Ruth. I don't know if, you, but if you've ever been to a wedding and you've heard that line, like, your people will be my people, my God will be, don't, don't ask me to leave you or forsake you, that sort of thing. Like, that's actually something that uh, a daughter-in-law says to her mother-in-law. Um, so we, we do take it a bit out of context at weddings, but it's really, really beautiful. And so we're going to jump in next week and look at the story of Ruth. And we're going to ask some questions about what might the story of Ruth be saying that actually needs to be heard in our day, maybe just as much as it ever has. Because I think the story of Ruth is really, really practical and pertinent to, to this, can, this, this cultural moment we're living in right here, right now. So I hope you'll be with us next week. Um, hope you have a great week, Grace Point. We love you. Grace and peace be with you. Thank you.